Ed, uh, we might as well start from the beginning. Tell us about um, growing up in, in Philly and um, your experience with World War II. Well, growing up in Philadelphia was pretty good for young people in the arts because what they did when you went to elementary school, if you were a musician or an artist and you showed some talent, they allow you to go after school downtown to a special school that the Board of Education would run for artists or for musicians. So I was one of those uh, fortunate ones that was able to go down after school to do more work downtown. Also, if you were in, in, not in the school system, there were other Saturday schools and museum schools run by a community art groups. So it was a very good town to grow up in if you had some talent that, were, that the schools would encourage. That was fun. And uh, that was very helpful. My uh, high school teacher, later on when I got into high school, had uh, been very proud of having graduated many artists who went on to become very successful and prominent. You know, the photographer Irving Penn, the, uh, the Berenstain, uh, a young man, a young woman who became the Berenstain, did the, 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 the little bear, yeah. bear comics. I grew up with those. Quite, they were quite wonderful. And uh, many others. So he, he uh, wanted to be sure that I would get a scholarship to go to the museum school. So he walked all the way home with me to my parents' house, knocked on the screen door, came in and sat down with him and said he'd like to think about me getting a scholarship to go to the art school. And this was the post-depression days still. It was the late, uh, late, 30s. late 1930s, early 40s. And they were very apprehensive, as you can guess, about being an artist. But uh, he persuaded them that uh, it would be a good thing, and I did. Went to the art school downtown for a, a couple of years until I went into the service. Mid 40s, served in Italy with the 88th Infantry Division. This would have been 43, 44. 43, 44, 45. Okay. Came back in 46. The interesting thing about being abroad, I had never been away from home. The interesting thing about being abroad was I did get to see some remarkable uh, towns and events. Uh, for one thing, I had her, I had. Uh, done something commendable apparently, so I got a rest tour to go to Switzerland. And that enabled me to visit the architecture and the, and the, uh, and the towns of Switzerland, Zurich, Lugano, the main places. Also, towards the end of my stay, uh, we set up a rifle range in Venice on Lido Island. And uh, that's where, uh, in Venice, I got to see the, uh, the great paintings oh. and the churches. Marvelous riches, really, which I, I had never been exposed to, except to the museum in Philadelphia, which had a great Renaissance collection. Were there any particular pieces you saw that you'd like to mention? Well, the great Italian painters were there. And uh, for me, it was remarkable. Also, the architecture was remarkable. I had never had, had that experience. The, uh, the, the richer experience beyond that, if you want to jump ahead to 1960, when uh, uh, I was fortunate to get a fellowship, but Olay was a finalist also, so we went to Europe, France. And the, uh, the, the, the events in France that helped change my life really were, I had been interested in, uh, in poetry and books. My, uh, my house had a lot of books. My father and mother were, were book readers. But when I got to Paris, and uh, I went to the Bibliothèque Nationale, I asked to see the pieces that I had read about, Matisse, Picasso, Brock, Rouault. And what they did at the Bibliothèque Nationale, they, the caretaker would bring up a card like you have in the library, one of your library cards. And in those days, they didn't ask me to wear white gloves. <laughs> and he opened up the, I opened up the Matisse's and the Picasso's and the Brock's and the Rouault's. Oh, original pieces. I have one wall behind you, which I happened to find many years later. Uh, a woodcut, one of the wood engravings that Walt had done for the Passion. But once I saw those originals and saw how the poets and the painters could work together and how they, they, they really honored the artists abroad, 
when Elaine and I went to uh, Banyu, a little town in the south of France, where Mayol statues were in the middle of town. Uh, that was the town where Mayol made handmade paper for his books. Oh, wow. And uh, in Surrey, we, we uh, went to the small museum in Surrey, the town which had a small bull ring, so Picasso would always come visit because it was tough for the bullfighters. How long were you there? We were there, the we were there almost two years oh, in wow. France. And when the French came south for August, we went north to Paris. <laughs> and that's when we both did some photography. And first we did the color photography at the Dejabert's Atelier in Paris. So those opportunities, uh, starting with the, uh, the earliest chance to be encouraged as a youngster, followed by my teacher's very kind insistence that I follow a career as an artist. And the fortune that I uh, did not uh, suffer during World War II, as so many comrades did, and later was able to enjoy uh, Europe and France and see the riches which I had only read about and seen about. Yeah. I remember when I was in art school, somewhere in the second, or th second year, one of my great teachers, Arthur Williams, who had a collection of French book arts, brought in these wonderful pages with black dots all interconnected in a wonderful pattern. We didn't know, of course, being young people at that time, that he was showing me the Balzac, the Balzac portfolio that Picasso had done. <laughs> Later in Paris, when I did get to see it in person. And also, uh, one note which was important to me and is reflected in, in the handmade books that I've done, that Elaine has done, was uh, in France, I brought with me a catalog from Harvard. Talk about the great value of libraries. I've always felt that the libraries are the citadel of the campus, absolutely, and they remain so. I brought with me a book called The Artist of the Book, 1860 to 1960, published by Harvard University, Peter Wick and Eleanor Garvey. And I brought that with me because I put little markers in the pages where there were notes on the printers abroad. So when we were in Barcelona, I went to see Home Pla. Pla was Picasso's printer in Mallorca. When I were in Paris, I went to see Dejaber, and the elder Dejaber was still alive. And he noticed, he thanked he me him. for showing, showing me all the, all the pages in which he had done the work with Charles Despio, and later with Dali, and Zawuki, and the contemporaries whom we met when we were in Paris. So all those experiences uh, actually culminated in a visit, also mentioned in the book, to Pierre Andre Benoit. Benoit was a uh, poet and a painter who lived in south southern France in Alice. And he did miniature books, tiny little books, but he also did larger books, which Picasso had asked him to do, and a few others. And he was a great friend of René Char. And I met with him. I spent a wonderful day with him. He showed me all of his work, took me to his, his, uh, his printing studio, and showed me, demonstrated how he would take a four page, a large sheet, uh, fold it in four, tear the one seam on the top, fold them again, and fold the fr fr front cover over so that it became a, a mini, mini folio in which he would insert a print with the poem of the poet he wanted to honor, with a print by the artist he wanted to include. He wanted to team me up with an Italian poet. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. I came back to the United States. And uh, I had hoped to bring an exhibition of his work to the United States. I never did. I wrote an essay about him for the Caxton uh, Club in Chicago newsletter. But he really showed me how one person who loves text, who loves books, who loves art, could personally make some kind of portfolio, portfolio either very complicated or very simple photo which could uh, create something hopefully new and an invitation to the reader. Uh, Mel Rowe once had a quote where he said that to create a, uh, a story or a poem is already a miracle, but to add to it a work of art that responds to it 
is to, is to, is to find yet another. And, and that you would create some kind of unity, some kind of spiritual unity of people who respond to each other. And hopefully that would be something for the reader to respond to. What I learned from my, my university teachers who are literary critics and editors were, it always stayed in my head, invite the reader. <laughs> Invite the reader. The idea is to invite the reader. And my friends and colleagues who are book designers and book binders and uh, printers, uh, I would always suggest if you're always going to have a display of your work, call it an invitation to the reader. And that's really what these days, which maybe we'll talk about later, the, the digital world we're in, and the challenge to libraries, both to respond to that and yet not give up the richness of experience, of the imagination, that, that's, that's a continuing challenge. It, it really is, and that, that brings to um, an example of our, our exhibit's title, it's called Print Matters, and how, I mean. Thank I, you for the title, I think it's a wonderful title. Thank you, uh, I mean, it, 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 it I think you know. it does. What, what's your advice, you know, with, um, for students, of both art and publishing and, and, and the printed word, um, you know, especially with works like yours? Guy Davenport, once a uh, poet from Iowa, once said that what it, sh it was wonderful for a child to discover in another child is that so someone is interested in the same thing that he or she is. This is how they get to play. And in a sense, that discovery that you can read a thought or respond to an idea that you thought was your idea as well, that's a kind of kinship which I think is most easily and most directly conveyed by reading. And I don't have any advice because those of us that were raised around books and, 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 a, and a love of books. And I like to believe I come from the people of the book, in the sense. Uh, I don't think there's any substitute for it. That doesn't mean that the wonderful uh, visual world can't be responded to. In fact, those of us who continue to work by hand, but also those, those wonderful photographers, or the, or the people that write for film. They also hope that you'll experience it in, in, in yet another way. But uh, I suppose those of us who continue to work with print believe that the, con the moment of, the con of contemplating and thinking is so necessary, I think, today, where I know I'm imploded by too much noise too much activity. Uh, it's, it's almost a plethora of, of visuals. Whether you're driving or walking or listening, or if you're trying to listen to music probably on FM, it's often interrupted by, by commentary as well. And that's why, although they're shrinking, I think uh, symphony orchestras will still continue, I hope, and, 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 although there, there are fewer of them. Music still abounds. And even the power of the song, whether it's the new music or the old music, what differentiates people of my age from young people always is when you know the music changes. But you're less interested in, in the new music. And I'm sure my grandchildren are interested and will be interested in music that I'm not. But yet our grandson who's going to be 17, loves to come to the studio where it works on, on the lane side where he likes to paint. He likes to paint and discover it because he likes the quiet of it. And yet I know he stays up late at night doing video games because he loves that too. Now I hope they're not mutually exclusive. I think I he, think you're he right. Loves, he loves to come here and explore his imagination and what he's read and heard, but he also likes to work with what he's seeing. So it simply may, may mean another way of getting information. I remember Buckminster Fuller, when he was my guest in Chicago years ago at the University of Illinois. People asked him the same question you you did in a way. He said, "What about?" What about reading? What about getting the information that we got from books and from our teachers? I, I, when he said that, I remember that my first view of the Acropolis was a little of a line drawing 
in a textbook. Today, you, you look at the Acropolis with a view from a helicopter, if you, and, and you're, you're closer to it than you will be if you're walking up the hill. It's very true. So he said at the time that the difference will be that the young people will get their information in a different way than we did. There's nothing quite like seeing things in person. There isn't. I mean, but you're right. I mean, in a lot of cases, people don't get that opportunity. Not, not like they used to. I, I'm reminded of uh, uh, visiting Rome and seeing the Colosseum. I was able to touch it. I was, I was a part of it. I, know, I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. Nor is, is one allowed to go into the caves of Lascaux, which Elaine and I had the good fortune to see before they built the replica. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the breath, the carbon, the carbon dioxide of breathing was going to destroy the murals. Mm -hmm. So they built replicas of the cave. But to see them in the original was what was, was exciting. Tell us about um, some of the influences for your books. I, 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 um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Mike Williamson. He, he, he had mentioned um, one of your works about the, uh, the melting of the bullets for the, 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 the Torah. Um, was it the pages that became bullets? Well, the, the, the full story of that, which is uh, in the poem that I, I presume we will try to exhibit in, in the exhibition, it's called, it was a plan to rape the Rom Press. Rom Press, I think it was R-O-H-M, was a famous Polish printer. And they printed Bibles in many languages. And the plan of the partisans, these were the Polish partisans in the woods to which Siskiru, the Lithuanian Jewish poet, had fled to join the, the partisans, the guerrilla fighters in the woods. And they, they of course, needed ammunition and needed bullets. So the plan was to raid the round press, get as much lead as they could from the type, get all the lead together. And going back even to the Civil War in this country, there, there were hand, hand molds you could use in the form of pliers that could form bullets. Right. So the idea was to raid the wrong press and make bullets out of the lead that you would melt. Yeah, by hand. Now, of course, the sadness the poet, poet writes in his, in his poem about it is he's, he's, he's saddened by the idea he'll have to take words that were so important to so many people and melt it down to try to preserve the world of libraries and of words and of poetry and of people. Uh, there's some question whether the raid ever took place, but the plan was to do that. And that's the reason for the poem called it, was the plan to raid the wrong press. This is very interesting. Uh, we uh, last month was Holocaust Remembrance, um, and we uh, we had a speaker on campus, actually several speakers on campus, who were Holocaust survivors, including a partisan fighter. His name was Mosh Berain, and he could have easily been involved in one of those groups. Yes, because there were, the, there were the Polish guerrilla fighters, the Polish partisan fighters outside of Vilna. There was the Warsaw Ghetto uprising mm -hmm. in April 19th, I believe. And uh, as there have been throughout history, uh, partisan people who are, as in Syria or, or, or many, many other countries, are trying to continue a fight even though they're in the minority and, and the oppressed. So it's a long history. And yet when I was uh, giving a, a, a series of talks at Western Carolina University, uh, North Carolina uh, had a program for teachers, elementary school teachers where they'd come for a, a week of exposure on the graduate level, even though they were elementary school teachers at that time. And uh, Michael and I, the poet, and I gave a series of talks on the value of poetry again and the, and the existence of poetry from, from childhood up. And what I brought to show the teachers 
were uh, excerpts from some unexpected sources. One was a, uh, a notebook found in the body of a dead Russian soldier in Afghanistan, when Russia had, had, had been in Afghanistan. Another was text from, found from a Vietnam, Vietnamese uh, warrior. And another was uh, some text I believe we found from migrants that had been trapped in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a smuggled truck who had also written pieces. And lastly, I told them about Harry Parch, the composer from California, who was famous for doing prepared music. By that, he would, he would make instruments out of objects and become, he composed pieces from oh. them. He read a long poem, I remember in San Francisco once, of texts he had taken down in prisons, written on walls by prisoners. They weren't poetry, but what they were were cri de coeur. They were, they were cries from the heart. Oh, and, and he would read them as a long stream. Oh, it's so cold and dark. I wish my mama were here now because it's been so long that I saw the green of my old farm and talked to my, my and, and, and on and on and on. So that stream is one which uh, continues, whether it's in the, in the forests of Lithuania or Poland, or whether it's in a boxcar, or whether it's uh, on, on a notebook of, of a dead Russian soldier, it continues. That's fascinating. And, and it, this, this leads right into, uh, talks exactly about what we're, we're talking about for the exhibit, and how uh, the influences of poetry and writing have, have led to your collaborations. The um, So in, in terms of Holocaust, uh, let's see, um, I'm trying to remember what, what other social events uh, have, have your works discussed? I know that, the, you know, in addition to... Oh, well, well of course, one of, one of my great heroes, as, long as, as well as Siskiver, from, who is now, who died in Israel after, uh, actually, he, uh, just to pause for a minute, in terms of histories, mm -hmm. he was airlifted by the Russians out of the woods in, in, in Poland. So he could tell the world about what was going on in the concentration camp. And later on, I, I, I saw a rare footage where he was asked to testify to Nuremberg trials. And the sitting judge, seeing he was quite weak, said, you may sit down. He said, no, I prefer to stand. And I want to talk about this. But another hero of mine was René Char, the great French poet, who had been very close to Benoit, who I mentioned earlier, my, my French mentor. Char was a... a was an established poet who joined the French resistance, became a captain in the underground, and uh, wrote many of his pieces called Les Feuilles, uh, the Leaves in French. And some of his stories are, are, are heartbreaking. He talks about one where he, he had been hidden in a hayloft, looking out over the square of this little village. And the village had captured a couple of the, of the partisans and threatened, and threatened, and they were go, we're going to shoot them if they didn't give away the name of the leader. And that's him. That is he up in the in, in the barn, up in the hayloft, looking down. Did they turn him in? No, they did not. They died. They were killed. They were killed. Or if not killed, they were going to be killed. I don't remember quite how it ended, but I remember how how heartbreaking it is to feel what he was feeling, mm -hmm. knowing he didn't want them to die. And yet his importance as a leader of the regional French Renaissance was that he stay alive. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are the burdens that, uh, interestingly enough, writers have also carried with them if they were also activists. That's true. Or were being um, uh, ostracized, let's say, in Russia or, uh, you know, after. Or, 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 or later on when, 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 when Stalin actually purged and killed the writers off and the, and the doctors. That's right. What, uh, tell us about some of your more recent works that you have in front of you, in front of, next to us. Uh. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit these four briefly. This one is called Opposed to Indifference. I was, I was, I was very concerned about uh, the fact that we see so much tragedy, whether, it, this is several years ago, whether it was the, the wars in Afghanistan 
and subsequently in Syria, and now on the migrant uh, problems on, on the border, and so much, uh, so, so much tragedy. I, I realize that poets very often are not just uh, writing uh, uplifting pieces, they're also responding to the pain and the, and the challenge of being alive. So I, I chose pieces from my poet friends, men and women, who had made some comment about not being indifferent. There's again a quote from Guy Davenport. He said, the purpose of art is to turn indifference to attention, to shine a light on some things and some feelings. So that was called Opposed to Indifference, and I included all the poet, my poet friends, my selected pieces of which they had written about, in, about some pain, whether it was a childhood friend or whether it was a war issue, which is why I included Renee Shaw. Another piece I did subsequently to that were poems from Africa by Sutskever, the Lithuanian poet. Israel had sent uh, people to Africa as new missionaries after 1948 to meet other countries of the world. And he was taken by the, by the legends and the stories of the African tribes. In the, in the book which you have, uh, he's shown uh, with, a, with a chief from the, uh, uh, I think it's one of the Zimbabwe tribes, I'm not sure. But he, he translated these legends of uh, African, African poets, African legends, and turned them into poetry. Okay. So that, that volume is called uh, uh, Poems from Africa II. I did a previous one called Elephants by Night, a poem about a wonderful legend of an African hunter who watches the beautiful elephants coming at night to water. But they all have masks, and one of them forgets to leave the mask, and it turns out they're not elephants at all. They're beautiful women, and he marries one. So you can, you can imagine the conjunction of those images in an African legend of, of animals turning into people and people turning into animals. So that was among those legends that were picked up from Africa by Sutskever. In 2016, I read some pieces by, uh, some quotes by John Ashbery and Dylan Thomas that uh, I liked about the angles in which one, one sees poetry and the naked vision, I think that was a Thomas phrase, of what poet poetry could be. And it didn't mean nude so much as it meant open vision, uncluttered, naked. So I uh, chose 22 of my, my friends who were poets and people whom I admired. I'd never met Shar, and I'd never met Neruda, but I'd met the translators. So I included Neruda and Shar. And, uh, and 20 or so other of my, 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 closest, my closest friends, my artists, my poet friends. And that's 23 poems by 22 artists mm -hmm. called Angles of Naked Vision. That was 2016. And then one of the, uh, I, I did an interview uh, of some of my childhood for a library at Amherst, the Yiddish Book Center. And the poet who interviewed me, Nina Pick, asked me about the, uh, uh, some women poets that I worked with. Kathleen Norris from South Dakota, who I think is a, what, writes beautifully about the prairie. Her famous book, the, uh, uh, what was it called? A Geography. Dakota, A Spiritual Geography. Marvelous book. And later about her retreats to the Benedictine Monastery, where she would write, called uh, The Cloister Walk. They became very, very, very prominent best. So it's Kathleen Norris. One of my favorite poets, poets, women poets, and and newer newer women poets that I had met subsequently, Deborah Pease and Catherine Casper, all the people who you have in in, in your collection, fortunately, for me, and uh, she uh, Nina Pick said to me at that time, uh, "What are you working on next?" This was in 2017, and I said, "Well, I really haven't done a, a, a enough work with women poets alone." And yet, I wanted to do something to highlight women poets. And I also was interested in the, uh, in the unrecognized and forgotten women Jewish poets, which according to Catherine Hellerstein, the professor at the University of Pennsylvania, goes back to the 16th century. Oh, wow. She's written a new book that Stanford has put out called The Question of Tradition, which is a history of women poets. Of course, always overshadowed by the men. 
until recent years, when women poet, poets have received, I think, their due recognition. Of course, certainly starting with it, with it was uh, with Emily Dickinson and, and, and Virginia Woolf and others. So I decided to again choose eleven women poets, uh, uh, nine of whom I knew personally, oh. two of whom I did not, and uh, include them in a book called Daughters of Emily. Because there's a marvelous quote by Emily Dickinson, which I use in the foreword. from Emily is, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Be blind. In other words, the, the truth is too much for most people. And she was hoping that the woman poet will display the truth gradually or also be too much. But it's not too much. I think that perhaps a great thing about the moment we live in is that I don't think anyone could say that Poetry is too much. I think the, the events of the world and the shock, the shocks of the world we live in, including the shock you had in Pittsburgh and the, and the shock we have every day in North Carolina or anywhere else, I don't think uh, anyone would be dazzled so much that they couldn't respond to poetry, particularly uh, poetry or music or language. And Elizabeth Cray, who I'd never been able to honor because she wasn't a poet. She was Marianne Moore's executor, and she was also the uh, co-founder of Poets House in New York. Okay. And when she was the head of the Academy of American Poets, she and I would sit in Central Park and feed the pigeons while we talked about poetry. And uh, she once said to me, remember that, always remember that language is behavior. And in that sense, it'll never leave us. And I think that's why language is behavior. And I think the poets remind us of that in very often a beautiful way, but also very often in a way that lingers in the mind so we remember what they say. And it has some meaning because we've become part of us as well. With your poetry, uh, you of course use imagery and illustration. Uh, can you tell us about your inspiration for the, the, the some of the illustrations and, and the work and the you know the, the, that you've used the imagery? Well, one of the things I one of the aspects I learned from the French was that you can either try to illustrate a book. Or you can, I, I would prefer to say, you try to illuminate what the poet has written. For myself, I think it's very important not to intrude on the reader's imagination. So I try not to be very literal. In other words, if it's a poem about a cat, and Neruda did a wonderful poem about a cat, and there I gave myself the liberty of doing a cat. It was too, it was too great a poem too about the majesty and the royalty of a cat not to do a cat. But ordinarily, I mean, try to refer to them either abstractly or expressionistically, because I want the reader not to be so taken by the illustration that he or she will not make a picture for themselves of what, what's going on. There's an Aruda poem about horses, like a, like a Lipizzaner in Austria, on a cold winter, and, and the smoke coming out of their nostrils. Well, I did some horses' heads in, a, in an expressionist way, but I, I, I don't want to take away from the reader that image that the reader can make of what that's like on a cold day. So to answer your question more directly, I, I, try to, I read the poem, I read it again and again, 
And I try to respond sometime with a clue. In the case of uh, Libresetti's poem about Florence, I did include a, a piece of the dome at Florence so you get a sense of the setting which he talks about Florence and being, being born in Italy. Or in the case of Hellerstein, which he talks about the winds and the language, the Arabic language and the Hebrew language near Jerusalem. I did put in a reflection of the dome, but that would be rare because ordinarily I would prefer not to illustrate, but perhaps it's a pretentious word, but to illuminate the page. In other words, add some light to the experience so that the reader will come away with another feeling, perhaps a, a, a richer feeling. There's a, there's a poem by Siska where he goes back to the place he was hiding in during the war. He was hiding in, in, in an attic and he, he cut a hole in the roof so he sees some light. And a little beam of light came through. And then after the war, he went back to that attic in some hut and hole and saw it. And that beam of light reminded him as it came through and he saw that the particles of dust floating in it, what that memory was. Well, I didn't illustrate that, but what I did do is a heavy black form, which you, which you may have in the exhibition, and, and a piercing beam, again, to set, to set a note or a tone for the work. But I don't think I'm really illustrating it, and yet the French would say, yes, these are illustrated books. In a sense, I accept that. But I, I, it's not my aim to do a picture of it, as the wonderful pictures I remember as a child for Treasure Island or for all, all the Robert Louis Stevenson books. Oh, there were so many wonderful illustrators. And, and, yes, and today, for my, my, my granddaughter's delight in seeing illustrations in books, too. But again, again, that's yet another facet of what makes reading uh, a happy experience. I'm trying to remember the uh, the different illustrators of the early 20th the early century. Yeah, well, there was they, uh, not Howard Pyle. Howard Pyle. Was it Howard, Howard, Howard Pyle Pyle and N.C. Wyeth, Wyeth's yes. father. Yes. And uh, of course, going back to the British, Crickshank and Hogarth and all those wonderful illustrators. And the children's book illustrators of modern day, mm -hmm. who I remember when I was an art student, were quite, quite wonderful. Do you have any advice for students uh, who want to pursue poetry and art, or um, you know, our our students? Do you have any suggestions? Any advice for them? Well, so it's always we're always risky to give advice, <laughs> and, I, and I try not to as I get older, because again, as I said earlier in our discussion, it's another world for young people in a different world, and they may feel compelled to. Tell their, tell, tell their narratives or narratives that impress them in a different way. If you particularly want to stay, in, in, I think, in the book world and the richness of, you have to love language. You have to love typography and letter forms as well. You have to like the idea of putting it together. It's not going to make much money. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 a film like The Avengers, which is going to bring in six point three billion dollars around the world. It's not going to do that. But it's very satisfying because uh, you'll be inviting the readers and you'll be re reaching readers. And uh, it's a happy pursuit. It's a labor of love. Uh, I'm glad you said it, not me. I was, I was going to say well, that. Well, because of my own press, again, I, I, I must say directly and simply, uh, my press has always been not for profit. I've never made profits on the, on the work I've done. Most often, and almost always, they they they, they always cost much more than the, than the than the price of a library university acquiring it. But uh, we've supported our work, Elaine and I, like many artists and, and poets do, by teaching. And the income from teaching has made it possible. Also, since some people have been very kind enough to recognize what we do uh, from very, very rare moments. So I've had some grant support from uh, at one point, the land received support from the Florsheim Fund. I received some support from the Illinois Arts Council and from a private foundation. Again, some funds that went to help support the idea of putting out more books. The bindings, as you can guess, are, are quite expensive and paper's expensive. But uh, you don't think about these things. If you feel moved to do it, you do it. 
And again, uh, so once someone asked me once about a Baudelaire portfolio I did when we came back from France. We had no funds. I had these translations in my head for Baudelaire's uh, uh, Fleur du Mal. I didn't care for the English translations I had read in France. And there was one poem called The Enemy, L'Enemy, that I wanted to I translate it myself. But I had no funds to do a book with it. So I went down to Canal Street and I bought and I bought pieces of linoleum, linoleum tile, which you can get yeah. for a couple of cents. And I went to the lumber yard and asked for some scraps. I had my wood, wood, woodworking tools, which one of my dear friends had sent me from Japan, where he was in the State Department, my chisel. So I cut the wood cuts and the linoleum cuts. And I got some rice paper for in, in the art store. And on a kitchen table, I inked up the, the, the wood blocks and then uh, with a spoon, with the back of the spoon, like the Japanese have done for many years, I rubbed the back of it and I did my, my wood cuts and my linoleum uh, prints from that. A few years later, when I had a few dollars, I had one of my printing friends set to type. The point of that being, and I've always said this to students, if I could do it on a kitchen table, you don't need a, a, a big atelier, you don't need a large studio and a large press. It helps because it makes your work easier and it makes it uh, simpler. But if you want to do good work, you can do it inexpensively. In fact, the last memoir Elaine and I have done together, one of her, about her family, and her uncle who was lost over the Battle of Biak in 1944. We've done that by hand. We have not bound it in cloth. We've wrapped it in acid-free paper. Now we've tied it with a ribbon and we've run it as an inkjet portfolio on acid-free on acid-free paper. So it's possible to do it with very little fun if, if you want to do it. Now it's not as, not as impressive, not as lavish, and maybe won't last as long, but uh, it's worth doing. And if it's worth doing, you don't need enormous amounts of resources to do it. 